right. For those of you who just join in, as I, I was saying, um, you can click on your control panel and click on the button called annotate. And then you can select a stamp and you can put a heart on the country where you're from, because we would love to know where all, all of you are from. To know that actually we have a very diverse group of participants today. Actually, I feel that we might have had one from all the all the ASEAN country, and that is very exciting. All right, I've seen many people from Brunei, Thailand, and somewhere outside. Um, Where are Malaysians? <laughs> Malaysian too. If you're from other country, don't feel sad. You know, you can also let us know. Right. Right, I see many, many people from Brunei. Right. <laughs> All right, I think it's about a good timing. Um, thank you everyone for joining our small activities here. Uh, it's very great to see that we have many people from all the country. All right, let me clear this a bit. Okay. All right, everyone. Um, so uh, this is the time. Uh, officially welcome everyone to our Working on Women webinar. Um, thank you so much for your interest in our program. Actually, almost 100 people applied and it's great to see all of you are coming or tuning in on a Sunday like this. Um, so my name is Spin Cha. I am gonna be your moderator of the day. I'm from Thailand. So a little bit about me, I went to the Waisili Academic Fellowship Program back in 2018. Um, I went to the University of Connecticut in the social entrepreneurship theme. It was a great time, you know, I met so many inspirational people and I've been associated with Waisili ever since. So, um, and currently I am a founder of uh, Root Consulting, a youth-run strategy consultant for small business in Thailand. And, you know, at the same time, I like talking to interesting people and I like to be a megaphone for, um, to voice out the accomplishment of all the inspirational women out there. And I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, also in the, webinar with us are the organizing committee for the sharing a vision or SAV program. Um, you can see them having the same background as I do. So we have uh, five of them here, uh, Afiq, Jimmy, Jim, Hanif, and Hisam. And thanks to them to put together these wonderful webinars for us. All right. Right. Um, and for those of you who might not yet know about Wisely Sharing a Vision, or SAV, uh, it is a project supported by the U.S. Embassy in Brunei, and it is based on a premise that, you know, we have so many uh, inspirational leaders in our Wisely and Associated program. They are the leader in their own industry, so we should provide a platform for them to share their expertise and inspire uh, youth across ASEAN. So uh, there are also two parts to the SAV. Uh, the first one is the SAV Connect, which we are doing right now. Um, it's gonna be an online webinar, it's open to everyone in ASEAN. And the other one is called the SAV Exploration, which is gonna be an on-site event in Brunei. Um, and anyway, uh, our project would not be, as I say, possible without the support from the U.S. Embassy. Uh, so we have here Mr. Jeff Barris, who will provide us, who is a public affair officer, to give us a welcoming remark to officially commence this activity. Hello, Wesley. 
My name is Jeff Barris, and I'm the new public affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy in Brunei Darussalam. The U.S. Embassy is proud to support Waisili's Sharing a Vision program and today's first webinar of the SAV Connect webinar series. This project invites leading professionals from different industries to share their experiences and challenges, especially during the ongoing global pandemic. There are four main industries of focus, including women's, entre women's empowerment, entrepreneurship, education, and environment. And what perfect timing to launch this project, as this week, Waisili turns seven years old. I hope that it will be a platform to share positive messages between young people across the region, especially in commemorating Waisili Unified. Please don't forget to share your webinar takeaways on your social media and to tag us at US Embassy BSB and at Waisili underscore official. Happy learning, everyone. Hello, Waisili. All right. Um... Again, uh, happy learning and thank you for the support from the U.S. Embassy, which make this wonderful idea sharing session possible. And um, I think just a reminder before we actually start the webinar, um, some courtesy of our event. So firstly, uh, our team will keep you on mute the whole time. But if you have any questions or concern or idea, please feel free to share them in our group chat and we will address them at the end. And um, another thing is uh, we kindly request you to turn on your camera. You know, during this pandemic time, we try our best to make our event as comparable to the face-to-face -face, uh, um, conference as possible. All right. Um, Okay, without further ado, I think we should get right into today's topic. So as you may know, today's topic is about, you know, working on women. What exactly is that? So I think all of you might have seen that women empowerment has been the recurring issues or themes among social change makers to, you know, address and alleviate. Um, however, if we really look into it, there are many aspects to women empowerment and that is because there are so many instances of issues and there are many different national contexts and problems as well. And then for persons like you or like me who might not be in the field yet, we might wonder um, where should we start? What should we focus on? What issue should we address? And that's why today we have put together a very diverse group of speakers. Uh, they are from four different countries working on four different missions. We're going to be hearing from them, from each of them, how they are helping to empower other women. All right. Um, I would like to introduce our speaker um, for today uh, one by one. I think we can start with Aimee. So the first person is uh, sorry. the first person is Aimee Reimley. She is the co-founder of Time Solution in Brunei. Uh, she's one of the one of the Asia Pacific Obama leaders. She is also the co-chair of the U.S. ASEAN Women Leadership Academy. Aimee. Hi, hi everyone. Sorry, I don't know if I'm supposed to say something, but hi. <laughs> All right, um, would you like to maybe give a little bit more of like an introduction about yourself to, to all of us? Sure, thank you. First of all, thanks everyone for uh, giving up your Sunday to spend it with us. Um, so as Pink just mentioned, my name is Amy, I'm from Brunei. Um, I run a software consultancy firm here, um, which is really my day job, but um, a lot of what we do is try to use technology to um, enable more people to be part of the workforce. And so a lot of the work that we do is digitalization of um, MSMEs, but really promoting um, unconventional work environments and digital work environment so that women and minority groups in remote situations are able to access um, our economy. And, um, but uh, working on women's issues isn't something that I 
um, planned on doing uh, throughout my career is just something that um, I'm constantly drawn to uh, just by virtue of, of my own values and beliefs. And so um, I do a lot of this in uh, roles such as um, promoting human rights through the um, ASEAN Parliamentarians of, of for Human Rights, um, really trying to promote uh, the use of technology and also um, gender, mainstreaming gender issues um, in what parliamentarians do across the region. Um, um, my co uh, I was part of the Women's Leadership Academy, uh, part of YSEALI, and uh, one of my colleagues through there um, and I founded uh, SoutheastAsiaWomen.org, which is a platform to showcase uh, female experts from across the region and make them accessible to speaking, mentoring, and collaboration opportunities. Uh, because as we know, a lot of uh, panels don't always have the amazing women that we have here today, but really are, are very male-centric, and so we were trying to change that. Um, and last but not least, um, I do a lot of mentoring of um, young female um, entrepreneurs and speak about women's issues here in Brunei, specifically about accessibility to work, gender um, equity in the home. And um, hopefully um, I can learn from all the amazing women uh, here today as well as about how to do it in other ways. All right, we're excited to hear to learn from you as well. Um, so our next speakers, uh, Amalina Arifin. She is the program coordinator of YC in Malaysia. She's also one of the, uh, the Asia Pacific Obama leaders, and she's been associated with YC in many programs, including the Academic Fellowship and the Seeds for the Future program. Uh, Amalina, please help um, introduce yourself to all of us. Well, hi everyone. Hello from Malaysia. Um, as mentioned by Pink, uh, my name is Amalina, and I am very excited to be here. Uh, I've, I've read about all these women that I'll be speaking with and I ha honestly have no idea why they called me because, you know, the things that these women are doing are so amazing and I'm super inspired. Um, I am the YCD coordinator in Malaysia, but I also pride myself in becoming like a professional matchmaker, not in a romantic relationship, but rather in your professional relationship. So. Like, for example, if you are in Malaysia and you're looking for um, connections or like any initiatives that are similar things to you, I am probably like have enough resources to be able to know the YC members who are doing it. So like, you know, I, I pride myself in uh, being a professional matchmaker. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Amelina. We're great, great to have you. Um, and our next speaker, um, She's from Thailand, or her name is Wipawan Wongsoan, or Nana. Uh, she is an activist and in gender equality and violence against women. Um, and she is the founder of ThaiConsent.in.th and ConsentConnection.org. Nana, please help introduce yourself to all of us. Hey, hi, so, like, hi everyone. My name is Nana. I'm from Thailand. And I'm like I'm founding the Thai Consent website to promote the concept of consent sex to like Thai people because in Thailand we don't have like even translation for this word. So it's quite new and like I do it because I want the like everyone to understand the power within themselves that they can like negotiate at least like in their like closest relationship and then they can understand their power in the like, civic, civic society later and like also now i'm uh, doing a master in uh, social design at uh, like on the design of atlantic in france my uh, graduation project is the decide to uh, decide that related to rape issue and try to figure out about how the world could do better in the innovation about sexual like to prevent the sexual like harassment and etc and also like uh, like i used to be a politician and also like i uh, maybe like continue like to work more in the like consulting with the uh, uh, gender equality and to like this uh, policy design for like for the more challenging issue that we might face in the future so uh, nice to be here with all of our speaker and i wish to have a happy time learning on sunday too thank you thank you nana i can't wait to hear more about the issues that you're working on from you all right and last but not least um our last speaker is from cambodia um Lekna Saroen. she is the deputy head of program at support her into support her enterprise or she investment and she was also a part of the Wisely uh, Regional Workshop in Brunei. Um, please introduce yourself to all of us. 
Thank you, Prince. I was privileged to be here and we together with all amazing women across the Asia. So I'm the deputy of program it's investment. We basically support the incubator, accelerator and access to finance for small micro women owned business in Cambodia. We are provide the first incubator and accelerator that tailored to my cultures, facilitated by my women and gender and investment in Cambodia. And yeah, so when many people are asking me why we are working only with women, so I look forward to sharing you more. Thank you. All right, awesome. Uh, we have a really inspirational people with us today. Uh, I think we should go right into discussing more so that everyone can learn more about, um, can learn more from each of the speaker. Um, and as I say, uh, in case you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the chat and we will address them um, at the end. Okay, um, so let's get into the first question. So I understand like hear from all of your different experiences, different mission. I think it will be great if each of the speaker could help, you know, tell the audience your why. Uh, what inspires you to work in the women empowerment field and what what is your goal? How do you envision the like perfect society for women? Um, maybe we can start with uh, Nana. Okay, so thank you, Pian. Like uh, for me, you know, why I start off this, uh, like I think since I was young, I always think that oh, it's so like unfair for being a girl. I don't like being a girl. I have so many uh, restrictions in my life, uh, like in Thai context, no? And then, like, but I used to think that like if I like strong enough, if I like improve myself enough, I can like improve myself. So that's how I believe when I was young. Until like I go to university, there was like one of my close friends tried to rape me in a party, and then like back then I feel like wow, okay, I cannot protect myself. And then like, uh, I keep it like, as like maybe I'm like, I'm uh, not protect myself enough. I'm like in a bad luck. But like years, like just one or two years later, I discovered that more than seven of my friends face to the same like situation, but with different men. And then I like kind of being enlightened that, oh wow, what happened here? It's not about like personal issue, nah. it's about the structural issue that allows like uh, the young men or men in our country like, take advantage of like the other women. And so that, and after that, I feel like I cannot uh, like, let the society continue like this. So we try to like um, make the like, platform, not the knowledge, uh, the resources to make people at least understand that um, like what is consent why you should not be guilty from being taken advantage of because like if we like uh, born as a girl in Thailand you are always like taught to be a people pleaser so like we kind of like uh, want to like change that perspective and like also I think uh, my goal no, is to see that the women and girls in, in our society can like be able to live without the fear or anxiety that they should not bear from the first time. For example, like I know that in like my high school, when like there are like people go to like have to choose the faculty the, in the admission, I think many of like the boys who have no idea where should they do like, for study, they go for like uh, engineering. I think why like I think the like the girls they go to something like uh, something that looks girly, and I think it. Uh, it's not the right way when we want to decide about our future. And also, I once in my workplace, I work in the art industry, in the media industry, and it's like male-led industry too. So when we like uh, work, talk about like, okay, uh, meaningful sex, consent sex, they were all like so surprising that we can talk about like, this in the, in the, intellectual way, informative way, not that in the pornographic way. So it's quite to blow up their mind. And also like once I enter politics, I found that it's uh, not easy to be feminist in the political fields too. I mean, mm -hmm. like, even the, the other women, they like, they still feel like um, if women want to be like uh, here, she should be a like, strong, brave and prove herself. But like in Thailand, I think it's Everything is different because all of the country we were made by the connection of the all boys school. 
and like and once uh, all the women you like maybe you get into business but not like they're really in the power so i think uh, the society i want to say yes yeah where like women are confident where women can be like live like, stably she's free from fear or at least she can like walk home and feel like it will be fine or if anything bad happened to her she will feel that like someone will support her someone will help her not let her like being broken for forever yeah. Yes, that's that's very interesting. How um, you know you 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 see actually injustice or just how the society governs women to be in a certain way, and then your goal is actually to you know fix the structure, the structural issues that that um, kind of prevents women from reaching their full potential or be what they want to be without having to care about the um, what, what the society would would want them to be. I think that's a very interesting um, goal, and maybe we could hear more from uh, Amalina if you're if you want to share with us what inspires yeah. you to work. Mm -hmm. Sure, um, I just want to give a bit of a disclaimer also because I'm a YCD coordinator. My job scope um, goes a bit more gen uh, general in nature, so it, um, you know it's not really specific on uh, women's issues and gender equity, but we do include that as part of our um, initiatives. So personally, as, an, um, as a personal inspiration, um, I, my parents came from a, a state in a place called Kelantan in Malaysia, and it's like one of the more conservative states, um, you know, where when, when you go to like, um, you know, in, in, conservative, um, in conservative societies, they tend to um, sort of treat women in a more traditional role, right? But then um, I am also inspired by a historical figure who lived in the 17th century, which is about four, 400 years ago, and her name was um, Jade City Wan Kembang. She was the queen of Kelantan, and she's already like, you know, fighting the stereotype that 400 years ago, she was never married. She is, um, you know, she's so intellectual. She can speak uh, different, um, many, many languages. She meets scholars and um and she is also really good in fighting and you know to think that how the roles have reversed now and how things have um you know have sort of regret uh, regressed since then it, it makes me a bit sad you know to think that you know if she were to be here 400 years later you know would she still be proud of the country that she used to cover i mean uh, of the state that she used to govern so that's um a little bit about um my why uh, you know because i was also like sort of treated within that conservative um values right and um my goal personally is you know to give a voice to those who are silenced and this also includes women because uh, as you mentioned nana you know i feel like you do not have the right avenue and i'm so glad that you are opening these platforms for people to be able to um you know to be more outspoken and we want i want to help it, uh, as much as I can in whatever way I can. So that's basically me. All right, thank you, Amalena. Uh, maybe if I may could, could share next your why and your goal. Sure, thank you. So I think for me, it's always been a really personal thing because um, for me, feminism is about fairness. And it, it was a very young age that I realized that things weren't fair. Um, I would be in primary school and um, I've always been a real go get her, I wanted to be the leader of everything, which can be really annoying. But um, yeah, and I was told that, no, um, you can't be head of class. Um, only boys can be head of class, girls can't be that. And so from a young age, um, society or at least institutional institutions um, that I grew up in, really hammered home that there's a role for men and role for women and i was very privileged and lucky that my parents never raised me that way with three brothers i was pretty much you know um as equal to them uh, if if not more so in their eyes uh, not as a favorite but as someone who needed to fight for her place as well and so um it's it's the unfairness that really drives me and it's not really specific to women but gender um across all, the entire gender spectrum and to see that um men can't do things because of um you know what society tells them to and then women can't reach um their potential because of, of what society tells to and, and i think we're very fortunate here in brunei that um 
we have we don't have the same level of prevalence of um, gender violence, even though it is there. It's a really big, big factor, but it's it's not as overt. Um, we have uh, same levels of opportunity for education and access to work. However, it's a very, very clear that there's a, a, a real glass ceiling in a lot of things. And I feel that every day I'm driven to just say and, and identify all of the the um, the sexism, uh, gender stereotypes that still exist in our country because if we don't talk about it, we can't dismantle it. And a big part of that is really in the home. And um, no matter how liberal some families are, so or how modern they claim to be, there's always. Um, this undercurrent of um, gender stereotyping that everyone still um, uh, pushes to their children and it pervades everything that we do. And so highlighting this is really um, something that I just do because it's, it's, it's a really painful thing to see for me. And it hurts to see women who have so much potential um, limit themselves because of this, men not being more nurturing because of this. And um, especially now that I have a son, it's, it's even more evident that, um, you know, the surprise when people hear that my husband takes care of my son is, is, really annoying in my eyes. It shouldn't be a shock to them that he's able to take care of my son. Um, and so things like that really drive me and that's my why. And sort of I try to channel it through things like um, mentoring opportunities to speak to young people and then really try to unravel that for them or at least to make them realize that that's still a thing. Um, any public platform that I can find to really highlight to those in power that this is something that needs to be addressed if we want to really fulfill our um, economic um, ambitions and but last uh, last but not least to really just um, ensure that we can use technology and all the tools that we have at our disposal to really try to to prevent things like gender violence so as part of um, the world design organizations um, design sprint um, with UN women to to build preventative measures through design thinking um, against gender violence and so so I feel that there are many avenues where this why can really emerge and um, manifest itself. But really, at the end of the day, it's about fairness. We're all equal. Um, and I feel that our societies need to really embrace that if we want to fulfill our potential. Right. Thank you so much. It's great to hear that, you know, taken from your own experience and then uh, it drives you to do all these amazing things to to also help other women too. We would love to hear more about what you've done in in, in further and in, in our panel. And um, but before that, let's hear from our uh, last speaker on your why. Um, Lekna, if you could share with us. Thank you, Pin. And so touching for all the speaker stories. So I guess I would like to share my story as well into my work. So I was a young girl in there from very, very modern years. And then when after I finished the high school, my mom just told me, okay, you don't need to go to, to university, you just get married and your husband will be, will be pay you to, 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 to the university. And that, that time I was, I don't believe at all. So I just 17 years old and then I was so young and then I never come to Phnom Penh city. And then I don't know what is the city look like. And then I was lucky enough to get a full scholarship at one of the university in Cambodia. And then I've been, and then I go back and then I share links to the um, high school, the young girls in my community, and then telling their parents and show, showing how, how the education changed to their lives. And then through the Eastern girl thing, I always telling myself that I need to be, one day I need to be a woman who can inspire other women to do what they really love and break the social norm and believe themselves that they can do it. And I, I also was, uh, I think after I graduated in 2014, I, I don't know how many of you dream to write an airplane, to go to the international forums. And then I did. And at that time I was in the South Korea and in 2015 and then um, my English was broke and I got bullied a lot from a young pillar and then I you know like at that time I don't speak English at all because I really worried that they will bully me they were joking at me and then I meet one of my um, lecturer in Thailand and that time I was in Chiang Mai and then she told me you know English is not your first language just talk just saying so the more that you the more that you're trying to 
hear, the more you're trying to talk, it means the better you are. And then I'm, I'm really strong when I'm hearing that. It's like motivated me to, um, to share, just sharing. And then I also sharing to other young women, young girl, and just, okay, just do what, just believe in yourself and be strong enough to share. And then in um, um, 2017, I did a research and then I've been to like, okay, Cambodia, Thailand, and Myanmar. At that time, I did the research on the level of lies to understand about how river and food are important for the people and the women role in the communities. I was so touching at that time to, to hear the story of the women in the community about the household consumption, the children education, income using for their family and how burden it is. And that, and at that point, it's kind of like my, my instinct, my um, passion, commitment. And I, I always tell myself, oh, I need to go. I, I'm going to work with women empowerment related to fear. And then at that time, I was looking for a job and I found she investment. I'm very lucky, but I'm really like one of the enterprises that I really love. So where a wish or a value and vision is really connected to me. So a vision is about a world where investing in women be seen as opportunity, not charity. So we are seeing um, the women are not vulnerable. So what they need is the opportunity uh, to empower and to create a system, the ecosystem to their journey in their uh, uh, in, in their journeys, like even environment, education, or entrepreneurship. And so, um, so it's the investment we are working with, uh, supporting the women in small SME sectors. And why we are working with on, only women and it connected me, because in our country, 61% of women are, uh, of the business are, are already run by women, but only 2% of the women are um, a woman who own the business are formally and registered. In the local, in the economy, and then the M, we have the four M. So the first, we would like to bridge a gender gap in um, SME sector to scale up women micro small enterprise, and then we have women to transition in their formal economy, create a wider economic impact, create a new job, increase women to improve their like their household financings, and promote women as a role model and leader in their organization. So it's like um, when, so when I'm um, linked to my own story and what I'm doing right now, it's like just believe in yourself. You know, like I, I cannot imagine that I can't speak English at all. It's like because never learn on, like never, never learn English as from very remote areas, but yeah, it's just believing it. Yeah. So yes, it's all. Yes, thank you so much. Now you're very well in English and you also like accomplish other things as well. I think it's um, a, a great story to share. Actually, um, Legna also shared with us a little bit about, you know, uh, what she felt when she was younger and uh, what are her missions to, what, what have her done to help other women achieve the same goal. I think maybe, I think um, Aimee is also doing a similar kind of, you know, mission to empower women to, create some kind of like an ecosystem for women or tools for women as well as so maybe if you could share help share next um on you have your goal in mind uh, what have been your journey to you know help accomplish those goals and maybe share some of your like proud accomplishment with us for me okay <laughs> Um, so I feel that um, I'm really proud of uh, SoutheastAsiaWomen.org. And so that came out of a conversation that um, we had as participants at the Waisili Women's Leadership Academy in Jakarta. And we all decided that, you know, okay, everyone would have their projects. And um, we started all raising our hands saying, actually, if any of you need help um, with technology, you can talk to me. I'm happy to help anyone. Um, and another person put their hand up. Oh, if anyone wants some finance, um, uh, finance advice, or another person said, if you want some advice about communications. And this was all completely um, unplanned, genuine um, offers from everybody. And then so we decided, well, let's put our name on a spreadsheet and then we thought that there must be a better way to really do this not just within this group of people because um, as we realized through that program and other things that we've encountered 
women, there are a lot of female experts. We don't see them all the time. You're not going to see a lot of women on panels or um, on papers. A lot of a lot of women don't get um, invited to a lot of these things. And um, it's really hard to see the level of representation that we deserve. Um, but there are women who are experts in their fields who have dedicated years in, of, of um, research or work in that um, that they can share and they're happy to share. There's a lot of generosity when it comes to women in Southeast Asia. And so um, my, um, my a fellow country lead at that point for the alumni network, uh, when Chen, uh, uh, who's head of uh, Malaysia at that point, um, we decided, well, I'll tell you what, as our legacy project, we're going to put this platform together and um, highlight a lot of these women. So we started in 2018. And that sort of database of women um, offering for free, really, um, the ability to, to mentor young people, maybe be open to speaking engagements, collaboration um, from a wide range of industries across all um, 10 countries plus Timor less of, of ASEAN. And um, it's been a really amazing uh, journey to see not just the type of women who put themselves forward, they're um, legislative legislative council members, there's, um, you know, I think it was someone in the army, um, scientists, researchers, everyone just putting themselves forward to say, look, I'm here and I'm happy to offer um, whatever I can um, to help not just other women, but just anyone in general. And so I think that's one way I see where um, the technology um, using an online platform really strengthens the bonds that we have together and really um, makes the network that we're building through things like YC really accessible to a wider uh, public. Um, I'm also really proud of um, using, for example, technology to build systems. Uh, we build platforms in Lao, for example, that enabled uh, people who didn't speak English to actually access uh, work uh, with um, English-speaking multinationals. So that was something that was amazing to do. Um, and again, I mentioned earlier using um, design to build uh, potential solutions to um, gender or preventing gender violence. And so that was a really amazing experience for, for me to do as well. Um, I don't see these as success stories, but as journeys, because obviously we're not there yet. Um, but I am really excited about um, pushing um, sort of the, the message that our innovations that we have, that we're plentiful of, um, can be used to really solve um, gender issues, um, or at least support the, the solutions that are being put forward. I think that um, conversations are the, the beginning of that. And um, having, be, having the luxury and the privilege of being able to shape my career because I, I own my own business towards solving this problem has been a real um, benefit, I feel, for that. So in terms of um, locally, I, I think that um, what the Women's Leadership Academy has done is really help empower a lot of um, female leaders to to pay it forward. So even this year's uh, Brunei Country Lead um, was able to run a mini Women's Leadership Academy locally. Um, Nazira, she did a great job. And so um, we were hoping and, and looking forward to seeing a lot of the initiatives I'm involved in to um, filter to, to local initiatives that can help um, increase female women's voices, um, but also not excluding um, men in the picture because I think that they play a really important role in solving some of the gender issues that we face. So I, can, I think just those off the top of my head, but I think there's uh, more to come and I'm really excited to um, tap into the network that we have here right now to be able to do that. All right, thank you so much. Um, I, maybe oh, next we can hear from Nana as well. Hey, so like, uh, oh, there is like one funny thing I want to tell all of you is that like people always think that maybe I like, am like graduated from like law, gender study, or mm -hmm. like uh, politics, etc. But actually, like I graduated from graphic design, and <laughs> what brings me here now, like from the graphic design and art background, is that like, uh, like in I think we start to do things because we cannot tolerate like this anymore and then like we try to uh, collect the story and the example of like people like once we are uh, like uh, at first now in 2015 we opened a blog to like uh, promote a concept write write an article like write articles etc 
but it doesn't gain like much attention. And then like when the Facebook like is like coming to Thailand, everyone using it, we kind of like okay now like we are lack of the article. Like how can we get the example? So we open up for the Google form and receive the anonymous story. And then like I think the first month we receive uh, like the we receive around 300 stories from the anonymous sharing their like, fair and unfair sex experience. And um, like since we are like we work it in our free time, we like reward them like, by like uh, illustrate them like with a nice picture. Mm -hmm. And that's how things start. And I think um, what like it's the biggest journey for me is that first uh, like there are so many underlying stories that like people never know it exists and we never know it exists like a lot, a lot nah? and imagine about the untold story that happening now or like happening uh, like in the past so it's quite huge and this story never go to like the justice system because like they uh, they, uh, they they don't know how they're not confident enough or maybe they don't want to like harm like, their perpetrator so it's quite complex and by doing this i think i understand more about like how human like work how human function and also understand about what are the pattern that the preparator like try to like take advantage from the girls too because most of them as they read all the story they have a reason to do it they have a reason to convince themselves that if they do it they're gonna be like they can get away from it or like they uh they can do it somehow so i think Yes, from this journey now I am like shifting from uh, like okay we have the another organization like the Shiro or uh, like my like, friends uh, foundation that work on supporting the sexual harassment survivors but I think that none of them work about the uh, preparator mindset yet and the preparator mindset doesn't exist only in like, in bedroom no it exists in the world it exists in the workplace exists in the uh, power position about like so I um, now my journey is that how to fix the way to like how we uh, look at women how can we like respect them don't underestimate them and like give give enough uh, right, equality for women to access to the central resources and like um, also I received I think I didn't or the number like record yet but I met enough of the young girls in the like, university age or maybe uh, someone who is like already married talk to me that like the story of the other uh, changed their perspective toward themselves because before that since the conversation never exists no? they cannot imagine about about like about healthy relationship at all like in Thai drama we have the rape scene and we have all the toxic stuff like um, as a like normal like uh, role model of relationship not like love means sacrificing and etc but like once we tell them that there are another story of the healthy relationship where you are like you fall to the other where you don't have to like sacrifice a part of you to fulfill like to let someone fulfill you but you are full like what of you then you make it like nourish later it's a new concept that people now like think about the post the like the better things the better way to communicate with the other and also I think I received the uh, yeah like I think what young girls say that wow like she imagined herself in a different way and she imagined and she like interpret her past experience in a more healthy way that like oh I should feel less guilty for me feeling this I'm like, um, I'm all right to feel bad for this and like, okay, I can get better, things can be fixed. It's not like a eternal curse for them. So like, that's the journey about how, like how, how it works and how it's success now. But um, also what I'm doing now is that, okay, we have the media part, no? that we work with the mindset of people to the pop culture, et cetera. And also I think uh, in Thai consent, we tend to, uh, shift to the building the um, fair and supportive environment for women too because we um, like we extend from working online to like to the very offline context like we went to the to the border of Thailand and Myanmar to the like the most marginalized women and we found that there like 
no one know the issue no one know like how to help them and i'm like i try to use the like design process to like help them and etc but we found that it cannot be fixed like by project it should be like the whole system that like help each other so now like uh, we are shifting from media, media, media like, uh, organization into something that think more about the structural, structural, more about more in the policy and more in the financial aspect too. So we like, try to connect the dots. So I think that's my journey. You mean like I start from graphic designer and now I'm like, oh, <laughs> why I'm here? I'm wearing big even, so, Yeah, mm-hmm. like I'm um, not even in the YC too. Like I don't, I how to pin like, oh, I don't even know your program like exits and I don't know how to enter like in this kind of establishment. So yeah, that's my journey. I feel like you can come from nowhere and then you go somewhere. Like if you like, if we are serious enough on the issue. All right, thank you so much. I think it's it's interesting to see. Um, also, uh, if maybe just to 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 add on that point from 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 Nana, actually, uh, I, I I like that you mentioned about how you know it's not enough to you know help a lady, but it's also important that we made other other players in the community, including men and other people, to be or the policymakers to be aware of the issue that exists with women. Also, um, I, I think last time that we talked, you you have some challenges that emerged, like regarding that. Would would you be able to share with us like the challenge that you have faced, um, and also maybe share with us how you have overcome it? Uh, can you hear me a little bit? Because I I don't know if it's gonna be the next question. Oh, like, we can speak about it now. Yes, yes, it's the next question. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so like the challenge phase, like during the pan, especially during the pandemic, now the COVID, like um, I saw like some family where the mothers were like they were left in in hungry and like they were like try to like suicide because they lost all the jobs and they were all like stateless uh, migrant women so they cannot access to like any of the governmental support and even the local charity don't want to support them because they are not considered someone like in, in Thailand where right? you should help like migrants like that's how people think and um, and yeah so they were like led to survive in that sense and like also for the ethnic minority women they live in such a like very uh, primitive economic system like um, I cannot like we we used to like try a lot to like uh, create jobs or like do something about create business model like many try to help them but I mean in in that area the area that the women cannot travel outside of the area because they are they don't have the, the paper you know, the, the document so they were like, trapped in the village and secondly they cannot sell things online because like there are no like no cost like no service no no like delivery system so the economic very like, limited in the area and and restrict to the physical thing and thirdly is that they don't have enough money to buy from each other even one woman open a restaurant or a, a small one, eh? like the other one. Oh, I think she's on stop. Um, I think this might be some technical issue from Nana. All right, uh, maybe I can shift to other speaker first. Um, uh, we're, we're on the point where, you know, I've heard about all your journeys and uh, what you've done uh, and, and some of your accomplishments, actually. Maybe we would like to hear more since, you know, this difficult time. We'd like to hear from other speakers while on the challenges that you face while working toward empowering other women or working on your mission. Um, maybe you can start from Amlina if you could help share with us uh, on, your, on the challenge that you faced and how you've overcome it. Sure. Um, I can share it from two perspectives, from my professional perspective and also my personal perspective. Um, firstly, in my professional perspective, I, you know, my job is literally, I, I'm literally get paid to like, you know, meet people and eat with them and party with them and things like that. And obviously, I won't be able to do that during COVID, right? Um, and that is, uh, you know, it really makes me redefine what is uh, what is meant by community engagement now you know how are we able to have a really meaningful relationship 
with the people that we're trying to engage with through like you know through virtual means um and is that even something that you know that is possible um so right now we are currently doing regional workshops uh, YCD boot camps and things like that but um they have been um quite helpful um in trying to provide an alternative but you know personally i've always preferred a face-to-face -face, a physical um a physical meetup because that's where you know real interactions happen um i can't wait for the world to heal but i think that's a good alternative so like for example one of our yc Lee boot camp um we are trying to help people in sabah who are uh, you know on the borneo side of um of malaysia to provide a safer campus because um, some of the students in the University of Malaysia uh, of Malaysia in Sabah um, are having like a lot of sexual is um, sexual violence issues in their campus and they actually initiated a campaign on a uh, called Safe UMS and things like that and all of this was done um, through it was through virtual um, virtual uh, training but yeah I think it's still helps i mean you know so those those are like the covid challenges uh in my professional setting in my pers uh, on my personal side is that you know um as someone i think like a lot of the women here uh within this webinar i'm sure that you guys are very goal oriented very you know you think about like five year what are your five year plans what are your 10 year 10 year plans but um you know when you were in 2019 would you have foreseen that like, a huge global pandemic would have hit us and we're all forced to like slow down and take things one moment at a time. I think just like, you know, understanding and like, you know, slowing down is um, a challenge for me. But at the same time, I try to um, focus on my personal passion and uh, what I like to do. Um, so for example, I, I would have never done this if it's not for the pandemic, but um, because I like to draw, I learned animation during, you know, all my quarantines because we're currently still in quarantine. I don't know when we're going to finish quarantine. You know, if you guys do not have quarantine or if you guys do not have COVID in your countries, you guys are so blessed because, you know, I'm so bored staying indoors. Uh, second thing that I did is I also learned Muay Thai, you know, that I've always wanted to do it, but I never had the time. Now I do. So, you know, so yeah, that's, <laughs> that's it for me. Yeah, that's exactly how we do Muay Thai in Thailand. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> All right. Um, also, um, last time that I discussed, maybe like now also had some interesting like challenges, you know, that prevent her from um, that emerged during her mission as well as COVID as well. Maybe if you could share us with, with all of us. Thank you, Pin. So actually, my entrepreneurship journey is that from when I was attending the YCLI program in Brunei mm -hmm. back in 2017, and this is so uh, connecting me with the entrepreneurship, and I really, I really believe it both. So regarding the professional work as a senior position in the young organization by she investment, we have been growing a lot lately, start from five to thirty-two employees. And the first challenging that we really been through is about the people management, the team management in our team. Because I am not a position to implement the activity, but how to empower, to motivate and capacity building and mentoring my young woman team to be on the top of what they are doing and create the impact for the women. And also communicate across the organization and stay in there. It is not, that was not the easy job, I, I promise. <laughs> It has been so much struggling, but uh, what we have, what I've been doing is to give trust both sides. So just give trust to my team, and they will trust me. So just okay, I believe you. You can do it. So just go for it, and then I'm always here, no matter what. Um, the first, um, I always said, okay, I'm always here to supporting you, and you just try your idea and just go for it. So. And then because um, in that time, I, like one of my colleagues, she'd been struggling. She was stuck a lot because of the COVID-19. We have some of the project in the province and there's a launching project for our actually better program is the province. Um, we need to invite some of the government officials and also our partners to join. And there's a second wave for like just last, last week, I guess, in Cambodia and now we are with from home. And then we just immediately, we have a quick call with the team and then starting to discuss plan A, plan B, and plan C because the thing we need to adapt by the current situation. We cannot just postpone and delay just for now. We have a webinar race. 
So this is also um, some kind of the strategy COVID-19 strategy that we've been, we have uh, been discussing. And also we immediately we asked our team, okay, we start to working remotely and some of our, some of our college might have uh, internet, internet connections, the issue, the credit cards, the Wi-Fi in their home. So we just give them, okay, so we just give them some of the credit uh, like phone, phone card or Wi-Fi to support their uh, uh, Wi-Fi, their internet connections. And then in, in, that, in the COVID-19, we also, um, a lot of women just come to us and then ask us what they should do. Because of, as a small and micro business, there are a lot of impact, issue impacts, that, like most of them, especially a tourism industry in Simriap. Like in Simriap is a, is a, um, a tourism industry hub. Like most of the business, they are closed because there are no tourists to visit them. So what, what should they do? And at that time, we, the team, we discussing to each other, okay, so how can we still supporting them? Because this is the time that the women really need us a lot. And then we create um, uh, uh, an online platform where uh, like we call it learning management system. We have provide um, uh, some of the tool in Khmer Lanh, very easy version to a woman who can access. We do a lot of online uh, uh, talking with the woman. And also we also have um, digital literacy or resource where a center, like your Facebook page, we do a Facebook live and any uh, uh, thing that women they want to discuss about their business, their mental health, their well-being, because this is the time that they need to think about changing their business plan. How can they change into online? And some of the women, you know, they they don't even know how to type in computer. They don't know how to post their uh, products on the Facebook, create the content on the Facebook, taking an uh, interactive photo and communicate with the customers who are online. So, and all the things that we are um, providing with that tool and mentor and coaching to them, we also have a digital literacy uh, trainings. And also, I, I also, like, and this is part of our, our benefits, our women, and the team itself need to build a lot of engagement with the team, talking with them, because some of them, they might be feel so frustrated, so panic. I myself also panic back in March. So yeah, in, during during the hard time, and also um, one of one of the book that I really recommend to our participant here is about is called uh, Simon Sinek. It's a leader it class. So I really recommend you guys to 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 read this book because it it means how to be a leader, especially to be like we we we, we all have a, we all have a leadership like we all a leader, but but no one born by uh, self-confidence. So how to be uh, confident and talk to the team, to the women, because in that time they really, are, in this time they really need us a lot. And also we, we got, uh, currently we're going to um, um, doing more digital literacy program. And also we create a Kotra Real app where um, a woman can download the app and then they can um, uh, record their bookkeeping because some of like the traditional business in Cambodia, they do not have any record of their finance, their income and their expense. So they don't know what is the uh, finance forecasting, uh, finance or risk management. And now we create this kind of the digital that they can access. So yeah, so now we are uh, feel more um, adaptive of the COVID-19 and we really, um, go for the online thing. So we do both of online and um, offline for certain of the uh, event. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you so much. So basically the, the main issues, I, I think um, overall, like the common theme across all the speakers is that, um, you know, there is a certain social uh, standards or um, social expectation that kind of like suppresses all the women and or, or certain limit limitations to you know access to resources that suppresses all the women and what most of our speakers or all of our speakers do is basically providing the women equipping them with a safe space with an ecosystem with a support system to empower them to you know not to just uh follow the social standard but be what they want to be or 
you know, be able to know that they have the rights to do anything that they want to do. And, you know, hi, um, from the COVID-19 pandemics, you know, um, as you guys are providing some support system, there is some challenge that emerged you know, with the way that the support are delivered to those women, you know, it changed it from face to face to something that has to be, um, that has to use technology to enable those kind of um, interactions. So, yeah, I think, um, I think now uh, we've, reached, we've uh, reached the end of the time, but I understand that some of the speakers might have to leave early. So, um, Nana, if you have to leave early, maybe Please give us some closing thoughts um, on your side before we go to uh, the questions of, from the audience with other speakers. Maybe you could give us some quick thoughts on, uh, on how, what do you want to share? Any advice you want to share to young people who are joining this webinar today if they want to start their journey to, you know, work to empower other women? Okay, so I think I have two points left here. I'm sorry, I have to like leave like early, you know, for like the next meeting. So the first one is that like aside of working to empower women, I think we should also like work on men and boys too, because mm -hmm. like uh, since like, this year, you know, in Thailand we are like have the rising up the feminism movement, but also we face a lot of online harassment from like the the, the boys community too. And like I, I was so inspired by like um, the Pakistanis, the like, woman I met like years ago that she found that like women and girls change during the generation. But uh, like despite that, uh, she you know she she's an old one. She still have to fight a young boy in the same topic. So it's like the like the world or the world of fight uh, neglect them to. To, to like to work on them with the perception about gender roles to maybe like uh, being a side of women the others are so important the boys the father like uh, the male in workplace etc and like my last point that like so everything should be like uh, be seen as an environment no? because I start from preventing the domestic violence or violence in relationship right but a uh, woman cannot leave that situation if she doesn't have the financial sustainability. And in order to have the financial sustainability, she should like, access to the fair paid job. And by being access to the job, she should have the education. And by accessing to the education, it's like in Cambodia, it's like the family should not expect the girls to be the future like kid incubator at the first time. So it works in like from the belief to the system and to the and we and present everything in like financial uh, aspect so like for those who are want to work on empowering women i think in the next step it should be like uh, focusing on the budget budgeting policy and then like think about it like systematically and like yeah and what we do is great it's like sharing uh, the the progress that has been made and sharing the possibility in the future yeah, I think I'm like inspiring. Thanks to inviting me here to hi. Thank you and thank you for joining. Um, for the rest of speaker uh, of the speakers, if you could join in with us for a little more minute, um, I think there are some um some questions that are asked. Um, I think the the first one from Rabia Tool. I think it could we could direct it to to Amy and um, do you want to ask it um out loud or you want me to read it? Um, actually, I can read it. All right. How to Amy, um, how can we help women during COVID who had to juggle between household work and also getting their income? Oh, I think this is um, a really important issue right now. So um, I think it was like UN Women um, uh, did some research and then it's been suggested that we are pushing back gender equality by about 50 years. Um, in the space of a few months. So we're back to, I think, the 1950s. Um, professional women are either forced to leave work in droves or uh, because of working from home are spending more time at home and um, they are bearing the brunt unfairly of um, domestic unpaid work. Um, and this um, informal work, care work at home um, is really something that women are, again, regardless of how liberal or uh, modern that family dynamic is, tend to um, be foisted upon. And I think 
when you have all those uh, responsibilities and pressures to really just um, take up the extra load, um, it's very difficult to recoup some of the losses of your career um, losses or financial losses that you've, you've uh, made because of um, your, the loss of work um, as well. And so women have a, a bigger challenge to really trying to regain um, all the lost months um, that they've had to face this year. Um, there is no panacea, there's no specific answer to how they can solve that problem. Because I think as we're about to see, or as we're seeing already, the world's going to be facing, I think the biggest recession um, that you know um, our generation's ever seen. And so um, whether you're a man or a woman, work is, finding work is gonna be hard, um, keeping, jobs will be harder um, and women will be, uh, especially minority women, um, will find it hardest to be able to uh, claw back any, any form of, of what normal was before this. Um, saying that though, um, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of new opportunities that we'll have to scramble for and there's a lot of creativity and innovation that you're going to have to um, use to be able to to really try to find some work right now. Um, I think the first step is having an honest conversation with the people in your household um, as to who's, hold, who's bearing um, the brunt of the household chores and work and caring responsibilities because without that, without that conversation, without a rebalancing of um, your roles at home, uh, you don't have the bandwidth even to go out and find something different to, to support yourself. And so this is where that difficult conversation comes in. This is where institutions need to really step in and um, either bring in laws to enforce, enforce that um, discussion or have that really highlighted in your national agenda. If you don't do that as a country through um, the government, through um, organizations, through companies that, that you know, um, employ a lot of people, then these women don't even have a chance to even start. And so um, I think that's the priority right now. And everyone here on this call, you need to be the, the people to start that conversations in your home. If you're not the the woman doing all the work at home right now then you need to be able to assess who is and then to really bring that conversation to light and try to reassign roles better because i guarantee you if you have an honest look in your own home it's going to be in balance and you're going to have a mother a sister who's doing the brunt of that work so um i that's what i would recommend everyone to really do because that is something that's within reach and then we can look at how the economy can really help support um a work force that is struggling to really get noticed. All right, thank you so much. Um, actually, I think we've exceeded our time. Um, thanks for all the questions. I think uh, all the speakers will provide their um, contacts. So in case uh, any of you participants would like to connect with them, I think feel free. I think they are very open to, to, to answer your questions in case that you have had them. Um, Maybe um, I would like to get some last closing thoughts from each of the speakers again, and we'd have to close the call for today because we only have like one hour, which is quite um, tight. But yeah, I think so far we've heard um, from from Amy a little bit. Maybe um, Amalina, if you could help uh, give us some closing thought or advice for the for the young people in the call today. Sure, um, I have a few. Uh, I have a few uh, advice for you, young people because I'm not that young anymore. Um, first and foremost, maintain your values. Um, I think if you're a student, this is a great explorative phase of your life where you can actually um, you know, do whatever you can, go beyond your campus grounds and you know, try and help out as much as possible instead of watching Korean dramas in your dorm room. You know, this is a great opportunity for you to like, you know, self explore and find what are your values and uh, once you do I recommend that you do not compromise um, these values um, when you have entered adulthood when you transition into like you know all this adulting life um, because there will be a lot of um, challenges but if you maintain your values then uh, you'll be fine. Secondly is um, similar to uh, the, uh, the first point which is to have heart because um, if you have passion in what you do and if you have like you know full conviction in what you do you will not 
uh, give up as easily. You have resilience, you have tenacity to like, you know, help out the communities that you want to help out. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think there's also a lot of mention by other speakers in saying this, but then, you know, um, ask yourself, like, you know, are you involving, like, you know, do not underestimate the role of men in um, empowering women, because um, I think having a great partner or having a great support system, especially within um, the male, um, within our male allies, is really helpful in sort of like um, elevating um, the position, I mean, like, you know, women's position to a much greater grounds, you know, rather than, um, yeah, because like, we are half the population, so, you know, why don't we get um, some collaboration or why don't we get some help from the other half of the population that would make the world a better place rather than having to conflict with each other right um i think uh, i want to say this also like we were talking about challenge right so the challenge that uh, a lot of women you know there is like you know stereotypical issues and things like that but um do not forget that one of the biggest hurdles or obstacles that women have is their own personal mindset because we are so conditioned to you know to have or to fulfill a certain stereotype or a certain mindset that whenever we feel like we are um you know we're constantly guilty about doing something we're guilty if if you don't reply a guy's call or if you're not entertaining a guy's flirt and he, he calls you a whore or calls you a bitch scalper i'm sorry by the way for my really french um vocabulary but you know he he, he gets so defensive about it it's not your fault by the way it's you know you are entitled to your own opinions um if you are you know a bit uh career driven and then people say that you are I mean, not, not even you, I mean, not even people, like you feel that like you're guilty because you're neglecting your family. If you are too focused on your family, you're like, oh no, I'm neglecting my work. You know, there's, there's always that constant guilt within women. And I want you to know that you are enough. What you guys are doing is amazing. You guys are like, I think what women are doing, you know, in whatever you do, you are enough. That's all for me. All right, thank you so much. That's very inspirational, I think, to all all of us out here. Um, and lastly, um, if like, if you would like uh, give some closing thoughts for all of us before we um close the call for today. Thank you. Uh, so inspiring, Amalina. I can hear your passions on that. And again, I was um imagine when I was young, and then I joined the kind of the conference like this, like webinar. And that time there's a conference, not a webinar, right? Because we don't have COVID, so we can do uh, physically. So, um, I, I like to me, I'm really understand about the women in in the South Asia. We have the our tradition, we have our cultures, we have our role in our family that we need to follow. So in that time, like this will be a lot of women and including myself, we were like, I have a, a not really good mental health because I want to do what I really love to do. And then I joined many conference and then listen about the inspiring stories, listening like Amalina Amelia, just saying earlier. And then I come back and then I listen to my heart. So my passion, my commitment that what um, I really want to do and what kind of the job or careers that make me happy and it, it means stress happy right when we do like when we work there's a lot of work so stress happy and just so just go for it so they will be most of our families friends partners they might suggest us a lot for what they think is better for us so because of their they really love us so that's why they they told us for what we should go and it's better for us so but just thank you to them because your your friend, your family, your partner is love you. That's why they're telling you to do this. So just thank you to them and start questioning yourself. Why? Is, why is this? What is the reason? Why and why? Why again? And then after you get the reason, you can listen your 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 passions, your commitment for what you really want to do. And in the perspective of the of the entrepreneurs, we are risk taker. So we take risks. So we might, we might don't have any income for the first time, but we really passion and commitment and do what we really love to do. And so just go for it. And yeah, this is what I, I want to share. Thank you. 
All right, thank you so much. Um, I think the whole, I feel that the whole point of today is, you know, our intention is to share the different perspectives of such a diverse group of, of, of speakers, you know, even though they are from different backgrounds, they are from different uh, inspiration, they have different goals, but I feel that, you know, actually, as it, at the bottom line is that they start doing something, they feel some inconvenience of them being a woman or having some expectations from the society that, that kind of or limit them from you know reaching their full potential. And they start the small step, they take the smallest step to to try to fix it. And then that small step, you know, as Nana and other speakers say, that small step when you really put your mind into it, have a great team to help do it, it can lead into something bigger. And um Another important thing that I would like to, to know as a closing thought is that, you know, it's not just the work of women, you know, to empower other women is not just about, you know, getting other, getting other women to help, but it's also how do we include other people, other stakeholders in the community, including men, etc., to also understand that there is this problem that exists in, there, is, there are those problems that exist in our society and how do we fix them? How do we engage everyone help to make this um, this world a, a better place, you know, for everyone, make, make it an equal place for everyone. So yeah, I think, um, thank you again. Um, so before we close, I'd like to thank you again, the US Embassy in Brunei for their, suppro their support. Thank you the speakers for taking your time to, you know, share your valuable thoughts with us. I know that the time is a little bit um, tense for such um, an amazing and speakers like all of you. And um, again, uh, lastly, thank you the audience for sticking with us through the end. And I know that there are some questions that I might not be able to address but we would do our best to, you know, share the content, uh, share the contact of our speakers or um, in case that you have further questions, you can reach out to us. We can connect you with the speaker or you can connect to the speaker itself. I think that's the whole point of, um, you know, our community that we are open and you can reach out to any of us in case you have any um, more idea or things that you would like to share. Um, and if you're interested in our further uh, SAB Connect webinar, there will be more next year, maybe around February. And for those of you in Brunei, uh, I'm not sure whether you already registered, but there is an SAB exploration event coming next week. Um, you will be on site uh, at EcoConis, you know, uh, engage with them, the women in entrepreneurship, look what they do, you know, be there with them, like in their days. And, um, yeah, lastly, uh, thank you everyone again. We would like to take some group photos. Um, if uh, any one of you would like to turn on more camera and we can just, you know, take this and maybe take this one photo together. Yeah, fix your, fix your hair. Right. Looking good, everyone. <laughs> Put on everyone your wants to look good. Maybe, maybe do the Asian check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. But I have to yeah. really have a very long hair. Hands, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's funny. All right. One, two, three. Someone taking it. All right. Okay, one normal photo. One, two, three. Yay. Yay. Thank Yay. you, everyone. Thank you. I hope you all have a good weekend ahead. Well, this is have the final Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Yes. Have a good day. Thanks. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye.